Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and this is AP Physics Essentials video 80. It's on internal energy, which is the energy found in a system due to the internal structure of that system. And I'm going to start with this system right here. We've got an egg. And so I'm going to release my hand from the egg, and it starts to spin, which seems kind of magical. If we treat that egg as an object, how could it just start spinning? It seems like there's no force being applied to it. And so I kind of cheated in this video. I'm going to show you what I had before I stopped the video. So what I did is I spun the egg, then I held it, and then I let it go. And so you're probably figuring out what happened. All of the material inside the egg was spinning, and so when I stopped the outside of the egg, I was just stopping that one object on the outside, and we continued to have internal changes in the structure on the inside. And that's why we got that odd behavior. And so we could think of that egg now as a system with different objects or different parts. And that internal structure and how they're arranged is, is giving us some internal energy. And as we change those objects inside the system, we can change the internal energy. And in physics one, you should be able to apply this principle to uh, mass spring oscillators and also a simple pendulum. And then as we move into physics two, you should be able to apply this at, to an electric charge found inside an electric field. And what's interesting is that energy is sometimes hard to observe it moves as it moves from one object to another but what we'll learn is this conservation of energy if we know that that set amount of energy is not going to change we can use that to figure out where that energy actually is and so what you want to do is be a detective when you're trying to figure out what's going on with an object and is it a system and so you can think of an object as a black box and you look at its behavior and try to figure out what's going on and so let's say this black box just sits there and so can we treat it as an object with no other objects outside of it for sure and so it, it fits it could be that there's no forces applied to it or there are balanced forces on it or it's just an object by itself so the object model works let me give you another black box let's say we have a box that's moving with a constant rate and so does the object model fit? Could it be an object or is this part of a system? Well, it could be an object again. It could just have inertia. It could be an object in motion. It's just gonna continue in motion. There doesn't have to be any other object. And so the object model works. Let's say we have a black box that looks like this. So what we're getting is forces that are changing. We're having these restoring forces occur well, now that object model simply doesn't work, and so we have to go to a system model. And so there are a few examples in physics. The first one's going to be a mass spring oscillator. So what I'm going to do is take this object in the middle, this cart, and I'm going to pull it back. And when I pull it back, there's going to be a force in the spring. And so that spring becomes another object. And so that restoring force is going to pull it in that direction. But now once I've gone in that direction, there's another restoring force pulling it back. And so it's going to oscillate. It's going to move back and forth. And the reason we're doing that, we're having these changing forces, is that we've got three objects. We've got the object in the middle of the cart, and then we have the two springs on either side. And so what do we know about this system is that the amount of energy I put into the system is being conserved. Now we might lose some to thermal energy, but as we convert that from potential to kinetic to potential energy, the energy is not going anywhere. And so if we look at the equation of a spring, if we figure out the period of an oscillating spring like that, the period, remember, is how long it takes to go back and forth. There are really two things that affect that. One one is going to be the mass of the object. The heavier the mass is, so since this is on the top of our equation, the larger this number is, the larger the period is going to be. So it's going to move more slowly. And then we have the spring constant. So the, the more stiff that spring is going to be, the larger this number is down here. That's actually going to speed our frequency up. Now let's look at a simple pendulum like this. So if I start a pendulum oscillating, does that fit our object model? We'd have to say no. And so this is going to be a system. Now what are the objects in this system? It's the pendulum, so the bob of the pendulum, but the other object's going to be the Earth. Since there's a gravitational field, that's where that potential energy is going to be. Now as we talked about in an earlier video, what are going to be the things that affect the period of the pendulum? Well the length, so the length to the center of mass, the bigger that number is since it's on the top of the equation that means we're going to have a larger period and then we also have the gravitational field strength so the greater that gravitational field strength is the more field strength there is 
the shorter that pendulum is going to be. So on Jupiter, for example, it'd be moving back really, really uh, back and forth really, really quickly. But on the moon, it would be moving really, really slowly. Now in AP Physics 2, you should be able to apply this to a charge inside an electric field. And so does our object model work here? Let's watch what happens to this charge. Well, it's moving away. Let's say we put it here moving away again. We put it here, it's moving away even faster. And so there must be an electric field. So this must be a system and that other object, that other charge is producing an electric field. And so if you put a test charge in it, then it's going to accelerate away. And we could even figure out the force using Coulomb's law based on what those two charges are and what's the distance between them. And so did you learn to calculate the expected behavior of a system using the object model? You always start with the object model first. And if that doesn't work, if this fails, then you have to go to a systems model. And what's neat about a systems model is the due to the conservation of energy, the amount of energy in that system is going to be conserved. It's just going to be converted from one object to another. Hopefully you learned that and I hope that was helpful.